In even the most traditional fashion, video games generally have two components when it comes to engaging the player. Once they are playing it, what is it that gives them the incentive to keep playing? This is something very crucial that the game's creator or creators must consider. The most common incentive is having a narrative, having a series of connected events to tell a story. In the most basic structure of a narrative, there's an exposition setting up the characters that are included, setting, tone, a context to your actions, if you will. Along with an exposition, there is a conflict that you most overcome in some way, shape, or form and reach a resolution, otherwise you're kind of just doing things for no reason. Exposition should answer the everlasting philosophical question of why. In contrast, games lacking this kind of storytelling and context offer incentive in the form of progression. Move on to the next level until you reach the final one, continue onwards to the next event, or it may even be as simple as gather as many points as you can. Regardless of how the game chooses to do it, it is something that is usually given to you by the game itself. You may Nikki, or Dream Diary as it's translated to, which was released in 2004 and made using RPG Maker 2003 by an anonymous developer only known as Kikiyama, is a game that struck me as very interesting and unique in the fact that on a base level, the game itself doesn't really give you too much of an incentive to keep playing. Instead, the player creates most of it themselves. When it comes to explaining the plot, the general gist that you can give someone is that you're seemingly a girl of unknown age who goes to bed, dreams, wakes up, goes to bed, dreams, wakes up, and so on and so on. The cycle repeats over and over. While in those dreams, you can interact with characters to drop effects to gain new abilities, and you can drop said abilities in the door room, and that's about all you can say because that's all that's explicitly given to you. Anything else that you can infer is strictly interpretation. What you're given is not near enough to answer the who, what, when, where, or why. Oddly, there is no dialogue whatsoever in the game via text or voice. Being so dependent on one's own interpretation is what gives this game its charm in my opinion. After this very brief tutorial of the game, your journey begins in Madatsuki's room. Though this is her listed name, as it is required for the character's name to be listed in the menu for RPG Maker, this may or may not even be her actual name, being that it translates to the word windowed. There's not much to do or see in her room, there's a Famicom gaming system that you can play a desk for saving your progress, and obviously a bed for sleeping and dreaming. When trying to exit your room through the door in the real world, she only shakes her head and you're unable to go through. There doesn't appear to be anything physically stopping you from leaving. Nothing is barring your path, no chains or locks. Perhaps there's some unseen force locking the door and she knows it's useless to attempt trying. Or who's to say that she even wants to exit her room? I interpret that she probably has no desire to leave her room. I'll go into what leads me to this conclusion a little later. Only in her dreams, she is able to exit her room and enter the door room known as the Nexus. Twelve ominous doors are laid around the room and you have access to all of them right from the start. This in itself breaks the progression mode of gaming and an incentive factor. Each door leads to a certain dream world that you are free to explore to your heart's content each all having their own distinct looks, NPCs, themes, and tones. Going into it, you may or not be expecting a more lighthearted, whimsical adventure, something in the vein of spirited away. Perhaps it was just my wishing, but it doesn't take long before you realize that it's quite the opposite. The worlds are abstract and nonsensical, often dark and off-putting. Even a good majority of the game's soundtrack often you eerie, melancholy tones as you traverse Madatsky's dreams. I stress that this game may not be for everyone. Truthfully, it isn't the most attention grabbing on the surface. It's not like you're a badass space marine blasting away at hordes of demons with action around every corner. You'll more than likely get lost in the looping levels, not being able to distinguish where you are exactly, with rarely any landmarks or any sort of map to track your position. Some worlds and areas act as downright labyrinths. What I also stress is that this is okay. 
I merit this game alone more for the experience than its actual gameplay elements. The gameplay takes a back seat to the thoughts and emotions that are evoked from you. In this case, less gameplay creates a bigger payoff. I think of David Cage games when it comes to this style. And boy, do I know that people have their opinions on David Cage, but his games follow the same formula very closely to great subjective effect. I find that this game is most effective when you're playing it with no distractions. Immersion is very necessary. Put yourself in that reflective mind state that allows you to just think freely. There's quite a bit to take in. What you take in and how you decipher it is completely subjective and up to you. With dreaming being the basis of the game, it's polarizing when it comes to what you get out of the game. It has been long debated since the 17th century and probably even earlier than that whether or not dreams have any specific meaning behind them. On one hand, it's been explained as the process of random neurons firing in our brain, and what we see is our brain consolidating that random activity into images. What comes out is just as random as what causes it, with no rhyme or reason. On the other hand, it could be said that dreams are the continuation of our conscious thoughts and memories, albeit more metaphorical, abstract, and symbolic. It has been suggested that dreams represent our innermost desires, fears, and repressed thoughts even. I prefer to go with the latter, but there are times where that isn't the case. I'm sure we've all had those times where we've awoken from a too good to be true dream, only to be disappointed that it wasn't real. Maybe it's a sign, maybe it's a sign of things to come. There's those dreams that you can wake from in a panic and glad that it wasn't all real and try to convince yourself that it meant nothing. Depending on your perception and opinion of dreams, you have more of a reason to continue playing. You may think that there's really no point, or you may search for a deeper meaning to the dreams and use them to uncover the mystery and answer all your questions. Who is Madatsky? Why does she not leave her room? What does she feel? That last question in particular was one that I found myself asking quite a bit. You never really get a sense of what Madaski is thinking or feeling throughout her dream experiences, or even in the real world. As a silent protagonist in most other games, you're still able to get a sense of emotion from them through body language and facial expressions. Even if there's no spoken words, they may still let out a sigh of frustration, a groan of pain, etc. No matter what's happening to her or around her, Madatsky has the same stoic, expressionless facial sprite, so you can't really get a read on her. But I believe that's where the dreams come into play. Seeing as how she is a lucid dreamer, the ability of being self-aware that you are in fact dreaming and consciously controlling your actions, which has shown that she is able to wake herself up at will by pinching herself, and the fact that she keeps a dream diary to document her experiences, I take it that dreaming is a point of intrigue for her. Just as much as the player is perhaps searching for signs, she's right there with you. So what are these dreams trying to say? There's a plethora of things you can get out of dissecting the little odds and ends of Madatsky's dreams, but the strongest and probably the most general thing is the recurring theme of isolation. By design alone, traversing these dream locations give an impressive and oppressive sense of isolation. You'll wander around alone in large voids littered with geometry and objects that act as obstacles. There are NPCs to interact with, with or without using effects that you find in the game, but more often than not, they'll just ignore you. They're just there. Usually the most you can get is a bloop or a bleep from them. There's a certain type of NPCs, fan name Tyrannigan. Translated to bird humans due to their appearance that enforce this theme of isolation. In their normal state, they'll just ignore you, but if provoked by the knife effect, they'll become lunatic and rightfully chase Madatsky. If they end up catching her, you'll be teleported into an enclosed space. No way to get in or out. You're in complete solitude. You may Nikki has no game over state, so the only way to get out is by pinching yourself awake, and you'll have to re-enter the dream world and start again. It fascinates me that instead of having her wake up instantly from being caught, you're forced to these areas. Wallow in your loneliness as long as you'd like. It's as if it's their way of putting you in your place. Furthermore, in one area of the game, you'll come across a group of these bird people having a little get-together, accompanied by rare, upbeat, actually happy music. 
There's some plants blocking your path, so poor Madaski can't attend the party and has to gaze from afar. Going along with the bird motif, it's clear that birds fought together. She is not like them. She is not invited nor wanted there. In a deeper location known as the Pink Sea, you'll come across a lone house. Upon entering it, you'll meet Panako, or Ponytail Girl. She pays absolutely no attention to you without the use of certain effects. Every time that you enter a house, there's a 1 in 64 chance that you'll trigger a certain event when you flip off the light switch. If you manage to get this event, Panako's room changes and becomes more eerie. Panako herself transforms into Yeboa, the most iconic NPC of the game. You are unable to leave the house and flipping the light back on or off yields no result. It's just you and the creep. Making contact with them, Madatsuki will be teleported to its trap world, an endless looping world where the only way to get out is by pinching yourself awake. I like to think of Yeboa as Panako's true self, only being revealed to you when out of the light. An innocent, normal girl on the outside to others, but deep on the inside and what Madaski really sees is the haunting monster who will inevitably subject her to solitude as she has many a times from others. Manoe is another notable NBC that you can find, though your interaction with her is very brief. She is one of the few characters in the game that you can say appears... happy. Any other characters thus far range from neutral, anguished, or just plain sad looking. Even the scenery is sad. Interacting with Manoe would cause a close up on her face, with it and her body fading away just as quickly as it came. This could represent the happiness that Mandaski once had at some point in her life, or a friend that made her happy, or just overall pleasantness. With it disappearing, it is nothing but a memory and a fleeting dream, probably to never be seen again. In another world, through some exploration, you'll come across a random closet. Take a peek inside and you'll find yourself inside all curled up. Madaski is hiding herself away from everyone and everything. She is trapped. Others have taken it to mean that Madaski is in the closet referring to her sexuality and possibly homosexual or bisexual. She could have been forcibly put into a literal closet by someone and is been reflected in her dream world. There's another version of Madaski that you can find after some specific actions. You'll come across yourself as a ghost. I think this goes hand in hand with her closet self. In the real world, that's how she viewed herself or wished that she was. Nothing more than a ghost. She's not really there. But in order to be a ghost, you have to be dead. Yeah. Those little instances are barely scratching the surface of the things that other players and I can and have pulled from these dreams in just one prevalent theme. If I were to try to talk about everything, trust me, I would be here for hours. There is involving things such as rape, being a victim of molestation, transgenderism, Madaski having violent tendencies, Madaski even being a psychopath have all been thrown around with solid supporting evidence. In a way, I feel like it's a little counterproductive to talk to you about these things as it's best experience for yourself and see where this game takes your thoughts and how it makes you feel, but nonetheless, I think it is interesting. I like to note that the idea of exploring abstract dream worlds in a game has been experimented with prior to Yume Nikki with LSD Dream Emulator, which had a limited release in Japan in 1998 on the PlayStation. I would say that LSD was even less of a game than what people consider Yume Nikki to be, or not be. The game's producer and composer in fact rejected the idea of games and wanted to use it more as a medium for art and music. The numerous worlds present in the game were in fact inspired and based on a dream diary of a co-worker that had about a decade's worth of content in it. Where Yume Nikki is what I would call controlled chaos with loose continuity at the player's discretion and interpretation, LSD is total chaos and randomness and a heck of a lot harder to even try to spin some sort of narrative. Where there is no end or objective in LSD, Yume Nikki does in fact have an ending, though it's not really apparent. At the first beginning, you're told about these effects that you can gather throughout the dream world. What you aren't told is how many effects there are, or even that you have to collect all of them in order to gain or unlock something. 
Given that there is an ending in collecting all the effects and dropping them in the nexus is how you get it, I still wouldn't consider collecting them all the primary objective of the game. I view it as more of a bonus, I suppose. So how does this crazy dream roller coaster wrap up? After leaving all the effects in the nexus and waking up in the real world, if you go into Madatsky's balcony, some stairs suddenly appear near the edge which were never there before. You approach them, and if you wish to interact with it, Madatsky walks up, and without hesitation, she takes a fatal leap to her death. Maybe it's the music, but there's just something about that that gives me a heavy feeling inside. That lingering question of why rears this ugly head again. But my take on Madatsky and her dreams, it was a necessary action in her eyes. Through the pressures of the world around her, Madatsky coats by withdrawing from social life, poor treatment from those in the outside world, and any number of traumatic experiences has caused her to completely shut herself in. Using her lucid dreaming, her dreams are where she decides to spend her time. Maybe her dreams weren't all just brooding, dark, and lonely as they are in the game when we experienced them, and they only got progressively so with time, and all the isolation started to take its toll. Her dreams were her sanctuary. Though maybe presented it as something shallower, you made Nikki as deceiving that there's a ton of things to see in the game, with the random events that may occur the harder to reach almost secret areas or just finding out what the effects do on all the NPCs. To reach the ending only through your own exploration, it means you spent a considerable amount of time with the game. At this point, I feel that Madaski feels like there's nothing more for her in her dreams. She has seen all there is to see. After so much time in them, it's no longer enjoyable for her. Any answers that she was seeking, she has yet to find. Or maybe she did. There was nothing for her in the real world, and now, even in her dream world, there is nothing. The afterlife is the next venture. That ghost Madaski that you find could even be foreshadowing. Coincidentally enough, the area that the ghost is found is fan name Mini Hell. Ugh. One thing that is puzzling is that Madaski awakens in the real world, but where did the staircase magically appear from? This could hint to the intersecting of the dream world and the real world. What's really real? Only Kikiyama knows what their intentions were and the meaning of it all. Although it is really tempting to want to know, I still say that I don't prefer to know. The fandom is rich with theories, discussions, and creativity. You and Nikki being shrouded in mystery is the appeal factor. With his success and following, fans have created numerous games in his vein and drew inspiration from it, chock full of his own mysteriousness and cryptic lore interpretations. This creates an almost virtually infinite world of ideas and concepts to be explored, and it's exciting. There's so much to get lost in and invest yourself in. The big payoff isn't just getting to the end, it's from feeling any number of things from the very beginning. This is just a tiny drop in the ocean of what there is to talk about in love of this game. I implore those to dive into it themselves, may they keep coming back for more, and to keep dreaming. <laughs>